Parashat Tetzaveh. I'm Rabbi Josh Rose, and this is Shikul Da'at. I remember reading once about the legendary saxophonist John Coltrane and his incredible practice regimen. He would stroll around his apartment, instrument in hand, repeating scales for hours on end, sometimes 12 hours. He said that he wasn't even sure how, many, how much time he would spend playing these scales as he walked around because he said it was really just all day. He'd pick up his instrument, he'd play, he'd put it down periodically. I even read once that he would play a single note for hours to get it right. And yet when you hear Coltrane's music, it is absolutely breathtaking in its spontaneity, its incandescence, apparent, apparent total freedom, especially in his later recordings. And I'm, I'm so interested in how these two parts of Coltrane come together. I'll come back to this, but I want to start us off by looking in our Torah portion at a very well-known curiosity in this particular parsha. Moses is absent from the Torah portion. He is spoken to, but his name is never mentioned. This is the only Torah portion, Parsha Tetzaveh, from the beginning of the book of Exodus, where we first meet Moshe, to the end of the book of Numbers, where that is so. It's, it's shocking. This individual who connects the Jewish people to God, who reveals the divine will, who helps the Jewish people confront God's presence and to embrace redemption, is suddenly gone. Strange enough. But why this Torah portion? Why this Torah portion is he absent? Is there something in Parshat Tetzaveh that might help us understand the absence of Moshe Rabbeinu? So another thing that we notice is that Aaron is mentioned countless times. Aaron is mentioned over 30 times. What is the topic of Tetzaveh? The clothing that the priests must wear for their avodah, for their service to God. So they had particular garments the priests did that they had to wear while making all of the offerings and overseeing the avodah, the, the work of the sanctuary. So these magnificent, beautiful clothes that are just used for this special purpose only by these individuals who are kohanim is the topic of this week's Torah portion. And remember, it is Aaron mentioned over 30 times in this parsha. Aaron is the kohen and his descendants, not Moshe. Moshe, though he is central to the prophetic tradition, will never serve as Kohen. So I want to connect this to something we thought about last week in the podcast, which is this transformation in the theology of the book of Exodus as we go from God initiating the religious experience and appearing spontaneously in the natural world to a world of the creation of the sanctuary in which human beings are expected to initiate, the Jewish people are expected to initiate the relationship with God. And we go from God in the natural world to God in community and in sanctuary in a much more structured way. So with that shift in mind, that discussion from last week's Parsha Truma in mind, we can use the curiosities of this week's Torah portion to understand the religious life and spiritual experience. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in his collection of reflections on the Parsha called Covenant and Conversation, in his, his meditation on Parshat Tetzaveh, dis distinguishes between what he calls the prophetic and the priestly modes of divine service. The prophetic mode is spontaneous, it's singular. It's dependent on the unique relationship of the prophet with God. The priestly mode, by contrast, is structured, uniform, replicable, and repetitive. Moshe we associate with the prophetic mode. Moses is, of course, the great prophet who encountered God at various moments. Remember, first at the burning bush, Moshe was not expecting an encounter with God, and God encounters Moshe at various points along the journey, and there's no routine to their relationship for the most part. God and Moshe have a kind of spontaneous connection. On the other hand, Aharon, who is the priest, 
is the one who is expected to carry out highly structured and repetitive rituals. So if we look at the Talmud, we can make a very interesting connection to this framework that Rabbi Sachs has set out before us. Because Aaron and the repetitive structure of the priestly avodah, the priestly service, is, is connected very deeply to our own prayer. We have fixed prayer, just like the priests had fixed practice of offerings in the, in, uh, in the sanctuary. The Talmud, in describing prayer, actually identifies a set pattern that we are to follow, which is our prayer to this day. This is the keva, that is the fixed order of prayer, keva, which we can connect to the priestly dimension of divine service. The Talmud says that the times of prayer are actually based on the time of the sacrifices of the temple. So we experience this whenever we go into Jewish prayer. We know that it has a structure. We know that there are certain words that we read each day. We know that there are certain paragraphs that we read before um, uh, uh, the next paragraph. They have to come in a particular order. We even have fixed melodies for reading these. We stand and we sit at certain times. And this structure leads us along the same path each day. The Talmud records a fascinating, med fascinating meditation on the nature of prayer. Having affirmed that there are particular prayers that we say, we get this comment into, uh, by Rabbi Eliezer, who says, the Talmud says, Rabbi Eliezer, Omer, he says that one who makes one's prayer fixed, that person's prayer is not regarded as legitimate supplication, right? It hasn't, it, it seems Rabbi Eliezer is saying, Eliezer is saying it hasn't, uh, the, the prayer is not efficacious. It's not somehow true prayer. And then later on in the Talmud, uh, it, it explores exactly what does Rabbi Eliezer, Eliezer mean when he says that one whose prayer is just fixed, is keva, um, it, it, that, that that's not real prayer somehow. What is the word keva? And the Talmud explores that. Kol shetefilato dome alav kamasui. Anyone whose prayer is like a burden. Okay, someone who's simply carrying something. When we're carrying something, we're just doing the task. We're not elevated by it. We're not inspired by it. We're probably not really even thinking about it, except thinking about, am I doing it right? Am I going to drop it? So um, the Talmud says that, that maybe that is what uh, Rabbi Eliezer meant. Um, and another opinion says, Kol mi omra tachnunim. Anybody who does not really use the true language of supplication, anyone who's not truly praying in a deep way. And then there is one other opinion, and then this opinion, it says, no, uh, keva means that if somebody has failed to to renew it or to instill something new, to innovate in the prayer, that is to say, is somebody has to bring something spontaneous, and you, each of these uh, these three opinions I've brought are worthy of study in their own right. But here, I just want to say that each of them is trying to offer a solution to propose what it would mean to look, to pray without just being in the realm of keva. You have to bring feeling. You have to bring spontaneity. You have to somehow not just view the structures of prayer as a burden, but rather as a platform for bringing true feeling and insight into your prayer. So you can see very easily how this idea from the Talmud might connect with what we're wrestling with, with the absence of Moses from this week's Torah portion and the ascent of Aaron in this Torah portion. We are being introduced to a different modality 
of prayer or a different modality of divine service. Just as last week we were introduced to a new theology with rather with God rather than God being just out there in the world, now God being so to so to speak contained, as if that were possible, within community or encountered within community, so too now are we being asked to reflect on this other dimension that is represented by Aaron, uh, this other dimension of divine service and of prayer. So this is the other side. There's this classic Jewish paradigm between keva, this fixed order that we've talked about, and kavana, which is generally understood as this like, deliberate application of consciousness to prayer. And I want to be clear that this is not just some academic debate. I think that this is very much alive in our own religious experience. This is a core tension in Jewish religious life. A religious path that's filled with true life and energy can lead us to soar. It should bring us to the depths as we face painful truths and elevate us to, ins to, to inspire us. It simply guides us along a path of intensive living and truth and confrontation of reality. But that kind of religious life and spiritual experience cannot endure without structure. And at the same time, we know that spiritual life cannot endure if it's just about deadened, repetitive routine, if we carry it in the words of the Talmud like a burden all the time, or without finding anything new in it. So this is why I had Coltrane in mind. Coltrane's internalization of the amazing musical structures that underlie Western music was essential to his art. The scales that he played repetitively, repetitively, day in, day out, hour by hour, gave him a foundation for reaching out to the heavens with his art. The priestly and prophetic modes, to use Rabbi Sachs's framework, came together in his music. And this could be a model for prayer in our lives and just our daily lives as Jews. Jewish spiritual life is lived within a tension between Keva and Kavanah, each informing and, uh, and helping us to understand the other, each one lifting us up and drawing us closer along our path to the Holy One. Have a great week.